Welcome to Founderline, the show where we answer your questions about startups. I'm your host, Joe Beninato. Thanks for joining us. It is great to have you all with us. Uh, Founderline is all about helping people with their startups. So maybe you're somebody who's thinking about starting a company and you have some questions you want to ask in advance. Maybe you're right in the middle of a company that you started and uh, you want to get some advice about a situation you're facing. Uh, maybe you're an employee who's thinking about joining a startup and uh, you have a question about uh, evaluating the opportunity in front of you. In any of those cases, uh, we'd love to try and help you today. This is a live show, so you have the opportunity to get in touch with us right now and uh, let us know your questions, and we'll see if we can, uh, we can answer them for you. Um, uh, the best way to reach us is to contact us either via email. The email address is help at founderline.com, or you can tweet your questions to us. Uh, the Twitter handle is at founderline. With that, let's get started. Our guest today is David Cowan, who's a partner at Bessemer Venture Partners in, in Menlo Park. Uh, David's funded and started a bunch of great companies, including LinkedIn, Twitch, Dropcam, and Twilio. Uh, David, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Great to have you here. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know how busy you guys are. Um, before uh, we dive into questions from the, uh, the people who are watching, I usually start off with just a few questions about your background just to get get us warmed up here um, so you uh, you've been working in the venture capital world for a long time you know almost 25 years now and uh, uh, in that time period you know a lot about the venture model has evolved uh, as, as Silicon Valley is known for sort of constant evolution um, I'm curious to get your, your thoughts on you know, how have things changed and um, what do you see happening as we move forward with uh, the world of venture capital? Okay, well, the venture industry certainly has matured a lot in the last 25 years. Uh, what, 25 years ago it was what you describe as a cottage industry with, with uh, maybe a couple dozen firms. Um, each one had maybe, you know, five to ten employees tops. and. Uh, really, what what we did was we tried to we tried to look through business plans and find investments. Today, venture firms do a lot more than that, and you have a much more uh, you have a lot more variety in what a venture investor is. So you've got some very large firms like ours who manage some very large funds, and and in addition to investing, provide a lot of resources to the companies in terms of recruiting and marketing help and other things. Uh, yeah. um, but then you also have uh, some new alternative ways of investing, like AngelList and R Crowd, and these more virtual networks of angels, and that's also a really that's created a lot of uh, interesting ways for companies to get started. Kickstarter, those kinds of models, and so the venture model is now a lot more varied than it used to be. And and moving forward, any predictions for the future? You see, you know, more innovation, sort of along the lines of AngelList and those sorts of things, or what what sorts of things do you see looking out? Uh, well, I think those models are are succeeding, and I think um, what that means is that uh, more and more people will be able to to enter the industry by participating in these kind of open sourced venture investing models. Yep. Um, people today can sign on to those those networks and just start investing angel money, and and they can be followed just like you would be followed on Twitter or Facebook. And when people follow you, you can create syndicates, and you can now uh, become a venture investor. You know, just by using a browser. Yeah, hang out a shingle online, right? That's right. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've actually been playing around with um, syndicates quite a bit, and you know, the quality of the companies is actually quite high uh, relative to, say, 10 or you know, 15 years ago. So um, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, what, do, do, you, do you see the, uh, the large, you know, multi-hundred million dollar funds going away? Or, I mean, that, that would eat your business, so I, I'm guessing the answer might be no, but uh, uh, what, do you, what do you think's happening there? Uh, I, I think that we've seen, we've seen uh, some degree of consolidation in the industry where there are fewer large mega funds, but um, I have to say the large mega funds are, are doing well. Yeah. And uh, we're, we don't feel like we're competing with AngelList. I mean, AngelList is doing a great job. Angels are doing a great job of seeding companies, uh, but all these companies get to a point where they need a lot more capital and a lot more help, yeah. and and so really, what all those angels are doing are just is just creating more opportunities for us. 
And so we we love the expanded ecosystem. Yeah. And um, and really, you know, I, w what's what's driving the growth of the venture industry is not really so much innovation in the venture capital industry. It's more the fundamental innovation in technology itself. What's gone on in the technology world has just been so exciting in terms of the explosion of opportunities from the internet and from and from um, all of the all of the ways that people can develop applications in, in faster, better ways, that it's really that fundamental opportunity that's driving success within the venture capital side. Yeah, no, it makes, makes sense, especially now with mobile, you know, just sort of the, the number of handsets being, you know, orders of magnitude more than computers uh, before it, right? And uh, Yeah, I mean, every new platform feels like this is the big one. I mean, PCs were the big platform, yeah. and of course there was the internet and the web, and then the cloud, and then mobile, and each one of these just and social, and each one of these just uh, you know creates even more opportunities to invest in. Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of that, you you've invested uh, in a pretty wide spectrum of companies, everything from cybersecurity, where you've you've actually started some companies, to you know consumer internet and hardware and satellites, and you're, you're kind of all over the map, which is actually similar to how I invest. It's sort of yeah. You know, if if it seems interesting and there's a good business there, like why not? But um, so, you know, some investors they like only invest in SaaS or they only do you know mobile or whatever. So maybe talk about your more varied approach and uh, you know how you got there and and uh, you know your your thoughts on it. Sure. So uh, so Best More Venture Partners has been around a long time. We're pro we're quite possibly the oldest venture capital firm, and so we try to think about how can we. Invest, how, what strategy can we follow that's going to make us relevant, not just this year or this decade, but over multiple decades? And so one thing that we spend a lot of time doing is stepping back and looking at the global economy and trying to think about what are the areas where we should be investing and try to do that work before we actually run into the startups so that we, we, uh, we create what we call roadmaps around the most interesting areas, and then we go prosecute those roadmaps by proactively going out and finding entrepreneurs who are who are uh, executing against those opportunities. Got it. So, uh, uh, you know, that helps us because it helps us proactively find companies who, who may be doing well and, and they're not raising money or they didn't know that we're interested. But also when we do approach entrepreneurs in that way, we already understand a lot about their market and they appreciate that. It helps us get to know them better. They, they think, okay, maybe these guys will be good investors because they understand my market. Got and it. So, um, it's, so an important thing we do at Bessemer is every single one of us every year takes stock of what we're investing in and says, okay, should I be investing in something new? And I think that's a little bit different. In most firms, when you're doing something and it's working well, you just kind of keep doing it and you double down and you hire more people around that domain. Um, and we're constantly churning through our strategies, always trying to come up with new ones. And so, yes, I've been all over the map, but it's been, you know, it's been three to five years of investing in this area, three to five years in this one. Got it. Um, and at the moment, for the last couple of years, I've just been focused on cybersecurity and space technology. Oh, wow. And, and um, do you publicly share those sort of, I forget what you call them, roadmaps, roadmaps. or like the areas that you're investing in? I guess you just did for we years. We actually do. If you go to bvp.com slash space, you'll see why we're investing in space. If you go to bvp.com slash cyber or slash cloud, um, you'll see our, you'll see our general thinking about these things, and of course, behind what you read on the web, there is a lot of research that goes into it. Um, we do, you know, we we really uh, think hard, and we expose our thinking to the whole firm in order to get in order to have it critically reviewed, and and um, before we go out and start putting dollars against it. That's great. That's that's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I I sort of uh, you know believe that a good investment is a good investment and it might not be in an area that we, we were talking before the show about space right and uh, the, some of the reactions people had including myself you know that that's interesting but I don't know much about it so even even though in my case I actually have a degree in aerospace engineering but uh, but not in building satellites and and so um, when skybox imaging comes along you know a lot of people were a little hesitant you you were one of the uh, the uh, believers, so uh, lot, lots of credit for for pulling that off. Um, so uh, well, I never let ignorance get in the way of <laughs> my, doing my job. Exactly, that's <laughs> great. Um, so uh, you know, there, there's a lot of talk now w about the stock markets and the Chinese economy and and everything going on, and 
and a little bit of you know angst in Silicon Valley, I would call it. Um, so what, what, if any, advice are you giving to your CEOs and founders um, about how to you know, weather the storm or, or how to uh, move forward given a little bit of uncertainty in, in the markets right now? All right. Well, uh, the companies we invest in are early stage companies and, and for the most part, what we do is orthogonal to what's going on in the public stock market. Um, the, we are trying to build products and impact markets in a way that's maybe not going to be visible for several years. Um, and in these long-term businesses, uh, it, it doesn't really matter so much whether, whether NASDAQ is up or down this week. Uh, the way that it's most relevant is that what happens in the public markets does affect how much capital is available to the private companies as well. Yeah. Um, when when uh, things get, get really heady in, in the public markets, then investors, even hedge fund managers will say, okay, it's too expensive for me to buy growth in the public market, let me start looking at, at the private side, which is why we've seen these unicorn valuations. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so during those times, you know, we think you should be raising money and, and, and taking advantage of the cheaper capital. And uh, when times get tighter, then, you know, of course that means you gotta, you gotta manage your business a little bit tighter. Yeah. So no RIP good times uh, missives going out, uh, you know, across the portfolio or? Uh... Um, I, we, we tend to think that, that things always regress to the mean. Um, <laughs> but uh, having said that, uh, the technology opportunity as a whole is growing fundamentally. And yep. so I don't think it's going to, uh, you know, I don't think we're sitting around thinking it's going to, you know, go back to how it was in 2001. Um, but you know, we do think that multiples will, at some point, be more rational. And I do think that there's going to be, you know, a day of reckoning for the unicorns who have raised money at very, very high valuations, much more than their public, you know, uh, comps would suggest yeah. they're worth. Yep. Yeah, someone's going to need to come up with a name for the, the former unicorns that are now only worth $650 million, yeah. uh, Well, I've heard the term unicorps is now Unicorps, is now great, <laughs> great. <laughs> Oh, uh, gosh. I don't know who comes up with these things. Uh, I think Eileen Lee does it. I uh, think that's her job. Yeah. So that's, that's, she's, she's the she's, creative one she's in the, the industry. the naming uh, expert. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, why don't, um, why don't we see if we can help some people out? Uh, remember, you know, the best ways to reach us are via email, help at founderline.com, and on Twitter, at Founderline. So um, let's go to our first question for the day. It's from Andy in Seattle. What are the main things you look at in a startup pitch, and what is the biggest differentiator between a winning pitch and one that goes back in the stack? What do you think? So, um, so uh, that's that, that's obviously a, a very very hard question. Um, I'll start by saying that before we even look at pitches, we do have these roadmaps, and we do have a point of view as to what we're looking for. Um, and so, uh, and so um, part of our roadmap strategy is to say, when we do look at startups, here is what we're going to be looking for. We're going to be looking for companies who already have this much traction or have this kind of expertise within the company um, or whatever, whatever other criteria. And we, we actually try to lay that out. And it's different for every, actually for every roadmap. So for example, Makes sense. Um, when, we, when, we are in, when we were investing in uh, early on in, you know, consumer, consumer internet applications like Skype. What we were looking for was user traction. And we saw that in Skype. We saw a million downloads right away. We said, okay, something's happening here. The fact that the founders were arguably wanted fugitives living in an undisclosed address in Amsterdam, and they couldn't <laughs> tell us where, um, turned out to be, at that point, less important than the fact that the Skype thing seemed to have some real legs on it. Whereas uh, when, we are, when we invested in SaaS companies, uh, we weren't, what we, instead we were looking for was companies that were able to climb the sales learning curve. And so they'd already had a lot of customers. They already were further along in the development of the company. And they were, they were now uh, generating more long-term, more, they, they, they had good unit economics, but they were still losing money. And so we identified that stage for that particular roadmap. And so it depends okay, on the got roadmap. It. Got it. All right. 
Well, Andy, hope hope that helps. Um, let's go to uh, Craig in Johannesburg, South Africa. So, um, Craig, welcome. Hope uh, I don't know if you're still awake, but maybe you'll see this tomorrow. Um, what was the defining moment when you realized that your idea should be pursued, and what was that moment like for you? So we, we were talking earlier. Um, you know, I, I think this is about the founding of a company. So you you started a few companies. Why don't you talk about maybe one or two of those examples okay. uh, um, that you've been through? So uh, so the first company that that uh, I founded was uh, was Verisign, and. Um, I wasn't trying to start a company. At the time, I was trying to invest in a little company out here called RSA. Mm. Um, it was the, really the it was security company out here that was started long before anybody cared about security because the internet, at least the web, hadn't existed yet, and the internet was not in commercial use. Um, but, uh, but I noticed that companies were starting to get onto this TCP IP thing and starting yeah. to share traffic. It wasn't HTTP at the time. It was SMTP and FTP traffic. But... Uh, for the first time, different entities were sharing networks. And I thought, okay, maybe someone's going to have to worry about who's doing what on the network and, and access and control. So I flew out here. I was living in Boston at the time. And I flew out here, and I met with the RSA team. And, and uh, they said, gee, we're so happy to see you. I mean, because VCs really haven't paid any attention to us because security is not something anybody cares about other than maybe the Navy for their encryption devices. Um, and so we're happy to see you, but you know, uh, we we don't really we most of our company is owned by by uh, a single investor who lives out in Florida, and it was a it was a an eccentric billionaire, a very smart gentleman named Addison Fisher, who owned 51 percent of the company, not by virtue of investing in it, but by buying up shares. So I flew to the Everglades in Florida and drove through the Everglades and went to his tin roof you know, his t corrugated tin roof office out there um, and said, I'd like to invest in your company, RSA. And he said, well, no, I, I don't want to let you because we have this really valuable IP. And, um, and I said, well, you know, I think what's more valuable than the IP are the things that you could do with encryption, like, um, like authenticating people on a network. Okay. If, you, if you issue certificates and you can authenticate people. And he said, well, okay, that's fine, but our IP is so valuable that I don't want to let you invest unless you invest a 20 million pre, which back then was just crazy. Nobody yeah. invested this in 20 like million. This is like what year, like mid-90s? 90, 94. Okay. Um, so, I, so next week I was actually at a poker game with Jim Bidzos, and we were saying, what are we going <laughs> to do? Because Addison won't let me invest, and he doesn't have the money now to go, go uh, build this operational thing. And we came up with this idea, well, why don't we spin out the certificate authority business and we'll create a new company and then Addison will be okay with it um, and so that's what we did and mm. so uh, I incorporated a company called Digital Certificates International and then cut a deal with Jim where I gave him a third of the company in exchange for all the technology and uh, we were off to the races. Oh cool yeah that was a uh that, that was a big deal. Eventually, uh, Verisign went public, I believe, and then um, was bought by somebody at some point? Or uh... Well, Verisign did go public, and they're still a public entity today, although oh, okay. they ended up selling the certificate business to Symantec. Oh, so that's, that's, what that's what it was. That's what it was. Got it. All right. Well, um, okay, so so sounds like that was, a, that was a great moment for you, right? Like when you knew... All right, there's some sudden nugget here and uh, yeah. a little complicated to orchestrate it and make it happen. But... Right. So that's more about... But that, there I didn't ha come up with the idea of the technology. Professor Ron Rivest at MIT came up with this idea of a certificate authority. Okay. Um, a better example might be a company that we know of as good technology today. Um, and that stems from an experience I had back in 1995. I was at a conference, I think it was Network World, and there were all these computers there, and they were running Mosaic browsers on them, among other things. And I thought, okay, I'm on a computer that's on a network. My my Microsoft email server is on the same network, but I can't get to my email, I can't get to my calendar, I can't get to my contacts or my files or anything. Hmm. Somebody's going to figure out, we ha there has to be a way to do this. And so I thought, I thought, okay, I'm going to start a company that's going to make people's data available to them on whatever device they're, they're on. And so uh, I started a company called Visto um, at the time and recruited uh, some folks out of Java um, and... Uh, and we, we started that company. We were a little ahead of our time because back then phones were not smart. They were carrier controlled. Yes. And so we had a hard time getting on the phones. 
Um, but eventually, uh, Visto acquired good technology and and you know built a, a good solution for accessing yeah. wireless data. No, I, I remember those days. I I was working on when.com at that time, and oh, yeah. uh, and so we were a portion of. You know, like Vista was sort of a competitor, but maybe not. And, you know, we were more right. web consumer focused uh, as opposed to, you know, enterprise or corporate focused, right? right. So uh, those, are, those are the good old days. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, um, uh, Craig, I hope, hope that answers your question. Let's go to uh, Arun in San Francisco. He says, the Bessemer anti-portfolio is a great initiative by BVP and shows a lot of maturity and humility. Are there... Are there any recent noteworthy additions to the Bessemer anti-portfolio? So, is it up to date, or any uh, any unicorns that uh, should be added sometime soon? Uh, well, there's there's um, there's no doubt we're going to have to ha we're going to have to add Uber to the list. Um, I, I don't think we're the I don't think we're the only one. I'm, I think many many venture firms have Uber in their anti-portfolios, um, and the. And one of the reasons we put the anti-portfolio up there is because it helps us learn from our mistakes. It helps us look back and say, okay, how could we miss this great thing? What were we thinking? And, and hopefully we don't make the same mistake again. And the mistake that, that I made, at least with Uber, because um, there was somebody on my team who came to me and said, hey, this Uber thing looks great. We should go invest in those guys. And back when it was, I mean, it was really tiny, um, but he tried it. In San Francisco, and he had a great experience, and he said we should look at this. And I said, no, there's no way. That's that's not worth looking at, because I looked at the market as lead gen for limousines, and there were already online companies out there who do lead gen for limousines, right. and they're not. They weren't doing particularly well. Yep. And if you add up all of the, you know, marketing budgets of the limousine companies and say we're going to get some lead, part of that lead gen budget, it doesn't add up to very much. Uh, but what I what I, we've learned from our mistake is that when these companies come in and they reorganize industries you have to look at you have to look at the slice of the of the gross revenue they're going to take not just the marketing dollars that those people may be spending today yep. um, and so you know uh, uber is is you know they're commanding a slice of the entire uh, you know auto transportation for rent market and yeah. and that's just a much much larger market than what I was thinking about yeah well and I, I would go even further that you know there are people who are replacing their cars with they just use uber all the time right and instead of owning a twenty five thousand dollar car that sits in their garage especially in bigger cities like San Francisco you know they, they can get around town much more conveniently and not deal with parking for half the money right so it's it's with, sort of a dramatic shift right and with with anecdotal data of only of only one consumer myself I would have to speculate that it's it's making a big dent on the car rental industry as well because when when I go to a city for a meeting of course you know it's much easier to just get in an uber than deal with the, a rental car yeah absolutely no I, I I totally agree I I'm I'm not of the belief that you know, all cars will go away and everyone will use Uber. Like, I enjoy driving and, and I like cars and, and I think there are lots of people, you know, the car was always the symbol of freedom, right, in America. Like, you someday, you know, your first big purchase usually was a car, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, because a house was typically bigger. And uh, so I, I think that will change somewhat, but I, I still think it's it's got some symbolism and some... Uh, so do you, do you like owning a lot of assets then? No, no, but I, I like having... I have one car, and I like it, and, and uh, you know, I like driving it, and I, I, I don't like driving it in San Francisco when, uh, you know, what's going on right now with uh, Salesforce? Um, yeah. Like, everyone's talking about traffic in the city, you know, don't even bother. Uh, so, I like, if there's a ball game or, you know, a big conference going on, like, I... I just stay out of the city, right? But uh, um, you know, as as the stock market and the you know valuations go, so does traffic in the Bay Area. So um, uh, some at some point it'll probably start to you know level off a little bit as well. So uh, um, all right, well let's uh, let's move on. Uh, this one is uh, this is an interesting name, Data Raid in San Francisco. Is it okay for founders of companies without product market fit or a path to profitability to go to Burning Man? I don't believe in work-life balance for founders, but I think it's a must for hires and employees. I do believe in family life balance. Am I out of line? So 
you know, Burning Man is one example, but I think just in general, you know, uh, uh, the question is about work-life balance and how hard are people working in startups and, you know, would love to hear your thoughts about any of those topics. Right, so, um, so I'm not an expert on Burning Man. Um, I, I, I must admit I, I probably have this uh, perception, which could be wrong, that most of the people there are people from companies that have a poor product market fit, and maybe that's what they're doing there. Um, they're looking for product but, market fit. Or they're, they're just, or they're just saying, uh, this is something better to do. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, work-life balance is, is a personal decision, and that's, uh, and you know, it's cer certainly something that, that I think is important for, for me, and, and I imagine that it would be very difficult to uh, undertake a really meaningful, long, you know, a, a meaningful, uh, mission of a startup if if you're if you don't refresh yourself and and give yourself ask, you know access to the other parts of your life you know in yeah. terms of fun and companionship and family and all those things and friendship and so um, I, you know when people just put put their whole lives into a startup that's sometimes okay for three or six months or nine months but at some point they have to recharge their batteries or or it's just not going to work yep no, I agree. I, I would, I would chime in a little bit on this. Um, I think the problem comes when you know you're going to a Burning Man every three weeks or four weeks, or or going on vacation or something else. And uh, I, I have actually had employees in a startup that did not have product market fit, um, you know, saying, "Well, you know, we we have an unlimited vacation policy. Like, I, you know, I should get at least six weeks off every year." Um, and, and I was like, you know, yeah, you can do that, and we can make that a, a company philosophy if you want, but you probably should start lining up your next gig because we're not going to be around much longer if, if that's what we're doing, right? So, um, so I, I, think, I think there is some balance, but I, I totally agree with you. Like, startups are really hard, and I think people don't always know what they're getting into, and it, it can take a toll on your, your health and your family life and, and whatever else. And... To, to sort of stay fresh, you have to, I used to use weekends to do that and still get some work done, but try to, you know, make it through to the week, to the weekend, and then, you know, recharge a little bit, and then, you know, take some time and go away with the family, but... Uh, um, if I were in a startup that had poor product market fit, I would just be spending every moment I could trying to fix that. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, the reality is, even if you have product market fit, you're, you still have lots of other problems, right? You're, you're yeah. trying to hire or you're trying to figure out the right mix of marketing dollars or, you know, whatever it is. So when you're doing a startup, you're busy all the time. I mean, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no downtime. Even when you're, you know, sadly, when you're with your family, you know, you got thoughts spinning in the back of your head like, oh, I got I to gotta get that proposal out or... I, I forgot to get David the you know the board update that I was supposed to get ready three days earlier you know whatever it is and so uh, well that I mean we're with our mobile devices around us when we're home we're still at work and when we're at work we're still at home I yeah. mean our yeah. our lives are now much the lines are are really blurred and uh, we change contexts um, not just within work but also back and forth to home life all the time yep. No, it, and it, it makes it hard. And I, I, I have a challenge with my kids just um, trying to model good digital behavior and not be sitting at the dinner table, um, you know, staring at a screen, right? And, uh, and so, you know, we wonder where they pick it up. They, they pick it up from us, right? <laughs> so, uh, so I try to put the stuff away and, you know, not, uh, not pull it out. But it, it's hard, you know. Your, your phone buzzes in your pocket or beeps or whatever in the middle of dinner. It's like a little dopamine, you know. Yeah. You, you, you wanna you wanna pull it out and look at it. Uh, I'd and, say even now I'm sort of really curious what's yeah, going on it's, it's, on Twitter. It's like I'm 20 just... feet over there. If you want to get up and go get it, uh, yeah, I... uh, exactly. Um, but it, it, it's uh, it's a little scary, you know. Like we we are getting we're, we're a bunch of crackheads, uh, you know. They they didn't call it the crackberry for nothing, right? That's right. Uh, that, that's, that's what it did. Um, all right, so we're, we're about halfway through. Um, we're going to take a minute just to thank our sponsors. So take a deep breath. Uh, you check your Twitter or, you know, whatever you need to do. Um, uh, so we, um, we couldn't do this show without the amazing support we get from our sponsors. And for this season of Founderline, our sponsors are Oric, Square One Bank, Accretive Solutions, and Ustream. 
And so I'll start off with, uh, with Auric. Um, I want to thank Mitch Zookley and the entire team over there. Um, I, I've been working with those guys for many, many years on a bunch of different companies. And I always tell people that when you're building a startup, um, the, the person you hire to be your lawyer is much more than the person who just um, does your legal paperwork and your incorporation and your employment agreements and all the sort of basic stuff. Um, yes, of course they're going to do that, but more importantly, they're going to be one of your most trusted advisors. They're someone who um, hopefully has seen way more than you've ever seen in terms of financings, hirings, firings, partnerships, etc. And so uh, when a situation comes up, maybe you're a first-time CEO and you need to fire an employee, um, you know, it, it's your first time doing that as opposed to, you know, the law firm's probably seen thousands of those or maybe even more than that. So uh, you want someone who's going to give you great advice, uh, not, not only the basics of running a startup, but also for your legal work. And um, so the I, last company I invested in, yeah? which was just two months ago, yeah? first thing we did was we we brought in Oric as the general counsel. Oh, really? Yeah. Who's, make, who's, make who's a lawyer? Difference. Give him a plug. Uh, well, uh, um, well, Mitch Zookley is, is, you know, the best. If we see a company where Mitch Zookley is the general, you know, the counsel to the company, that makes the company a lot more valuable to us. There you go. Unpaid testimonial right, right there. So um, uh, I, I agree with you. He's been a great friend to me. And, uh, um, you know, been, they, they had a 20th um, anniversary in Silicon Valley event recently. And it was fun to check all the venture law group people were there, you know, the, the old VLG crew. So uh, anyway, um, you know, great, great perspective. Um, if you want to find out more about those guys, uh, you can go check out their website. It's uh, auric.com. Um, next, I want to thank our sponsor, Square One Bank. And I've been working with the team over there as well for a number of years, um, Sam Bomick and Lori lumenti Gardi And uh, once again, you know, you, you want to have a great financial partner for your company. Obviously, they're going to make sure that the money that you deposit in the bank is going to remain safe. Those, that's sort of the basics. Um, uh, but you also want uh, someone who's going to help you out when, when you need advice on something or uh, setting up online banking just to make your life easier, uh, maybe getting you a company credit card so you don't end up piling up uh, you know, mountains of of debt on your personal credit card, and then God forbid, you know, something happens to the company, and and uh, uh, you know you're stuck with twenty, thirty thousand dollars worth of uh, debt on your credit card. Um, you know, th those are the sorts of things your bank can help you out with, and uh, the team over there is great at helping you navigate those uh, solutions. So uh, you can find out more at their website. It's squareonebank.com. Uh, square the number one bank.com. Uh, we also are working with Accretive Solutions this season, and uh, they're the leading business outsourcing firm in Silicon Valley. And I, uh, Martini Niganel is uh, has been my interim CFO and and uh, a friend of mine for a number of years. And I, you know, when she first said that, I'd say, well, what's business outsourcing? And and basically, it's um, outsourcing your finance function. So everything from accounts receivable, accounts payable. Uh, your payroll, um, doing your board reports, uh, your financials for 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 the board. Um, it's it's your temporary CFO, your controller. It's all that stuff. Um, at some point, hopefully, you'll grow large enough to need full time people to handle all that for you. But when you're small, um, these guys can do it very cost effectively. You know, a couple hundred dollars a month just to keep track of everything and make sure. Uh, your numbers are um, are coming out correctly every month. So it's a very important thing that sometimes gets overlooked. And uh, uh, they can take care of all that for you. You can find out more at their website. Uh, it's uh, as-bos.com. And then finally, um, I want to thank the team over at Ustream. When we first started Founderline, uh, Brad Hunstable and his team over there were kind enough to say, we really want to support you guys in uh, helping out entrepreneurs and startups. And so um, they've been helping us bring the show to you live every week uh, since we got started, uh, you know, well over a year ago now. So um, uh, if you're thinking about doing any live streaming, uh, you know, it could be for a company function, uh, you know, maybe you have remote offices or maybe you just um, you want to, you know, produce your own show yourself. Um, they can do a great job for you. And you can find out more at their website as well. It is Ustream.tv. So that's uh, thanking our sponsors. And um, 
Once again, if you have a question for us, you can uh, email us. The email address is help at founderline.com, and you can also tweet to at founderline. So let's, uh, let's dive back in. We've got about 24 minutes left. Um, so this one uh, is from Victor in LA. It says, uh, seems that almost 60% of BVP deals are in the later stages. Would you mind uh, sharing with us your thesis on Series A, B, and C deals? So I, does that seem accurate, 60% uh, being later stage, or you know, roughly speaking? Um, no. Uh, I, it, it may be accurate that, that that sixty percent of the capital we invest goes into later stage deals because those investments are so much larger. Got it. But um, every year we we make about uh, twenty five new investments that and and I would say uh, fifteen to twenty are early stage companies. And then in addition to that, we also make in addition to those twenty five. Those are twenty five where we're we we are joining the board. We're we're putting significant dollars in. Um, we also make seed investments, uh, probably another another fifteen or twenty seed investments every year. Wow! And so companies, those are, I mean, companies like Dropcam and Twilio, uh, those are companies where our initial check I think was about a hundred thousand um, dollars, just to you know participate in the in the seed round of a of a company that looked us pretty interesting or the entrepreneur was particularly interesting, um, with an idea that one day we'll we'll likely want to increase our our exposure. Got it. So, so actually, it sounds like way more than the majority are, early, you know, seed or first, you know, a round right. or what, whatever we're calling it now. Uh, right. Since the um, terminology changes. Right. I would say at least at least two thirds of our companies are either seed, Series A, or Series B rounds. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Well, Victor, uh, hope that answers your question. Um, let's go. We have one here from uh, Mohan in Bangalore, India. Um, we are developing a next generation productivity app in Bangalore. How do we raise funds from Silicon Valley investors for this venture? Okay. Well, uh, there are some funds like ours at Bessemer where we actually have teams on the ground in India. And in fact, our team is in Bangalore. And so, um, so you, should, you should come visit us in, in Bangalore and see my partner, Vishal Gupta. Um, and there, there are other uh, US funds as well who, who have presence in India. Uh, if if the if the uh, app that you're developing is is going to address a global market, then you may also want to come to California and and or somewhere else in the United States and pitch investors in person. And a good way to do that is to uh, apply to present within conferences like uh, TechCrunch Disrupt um, or or similar types of, of venues where you get investors yep. coming. Yep. And that, that I think that's that will be worth the trip. If what you're if what you're developing is a compelling experience, makes sense. And I, what I would add to that, is, and more from the angel perspective, is I get um, contacted by a lot of people outside the country who are looking for angel money, and it's really hard for us as angels to do an investment in India or somewhere far away where you know you, you have you probably don't even meet the person. Um, uh, you know, there's big time difference. Um, if you're spending a lot of time with them early on to kind of get them to the point where they can go raise money from a VC firm, it's it's really hard. So, I, in those cases, I would say try and find angels in Bangalore. You know, there there have been lots of companies built there, and uh, I'm sure uh, the angel market is starting to grow there, just just like many places around the world. So, um, um, reaching out to to those of us here in the valley is typically pretty hard, but uh, um, you know, occasionally maybe it's a friend of a friend, or there's a um, there's a reason why it, you might be ideal as an angel for those things. But uh, but it's it, it's hard as an angel as well. So um, so hope uh, hope that helps, Mohan. Um, let's go to um, Chris in San Jose. I'm a successful startup product manager and marketing person, and I think I have a great idea. What suggestions do you have for finding the right CTO to join me in starting the company? What do you think? So, uh, so the term CTO means different things at different stages of a company. Uh, early on, I think what you're looking for is a technical co-founder who's actually going to, who's actually going to, you know, develop the product. Yeah, sounds um, like it. That's different than the job of a of a CTO in a company that's got 100 employees and there's already an engineering team and the CTO's job 
is usually to think about next generation technologies or how your technology fits in, in into the industry or maybe maybe to go around to conferences and talk about the company and evangelize it and work in standards committees and things like that. Right. So um, I think what you want is a is a is is a you know a super tech coder yeah, person co -founder. and and a co-founder and um, and the best way to find those people I think is to you know attend the sorts of events where they're attending. Um, hackathons are actually a pretty good place to attend and in fact Bessemer has a hackathon coming up um, in the next few weeks and oh, you can tell you us can, more. Uh, where, give it a plug where where is where is it and how do you find out more uh, so so I am blanking on the specific date of oh. the of the hackathon um, I believe that we are we're either going to be doing it in our offices or at Twilio's offices uh, I don't remember wh which is the right location um, but we have uh, but the theme is to improve the Bay Area and so we've already got we've already got a lot of great developers signed up and and the challenge is to uh, use the uh, free credits that will be provided by uh, the companies who are participating. So companies like Twilio and, and SendGrid and Auth0 and, and Spark and others. Um, oh, actually, I'm sorry. It's actually going to be at, at Heavybit offices. That's okay. where the hackathon is. Okay. And, um, and developers will be challenged to come up with an application that improves life in the Bay Area. So uh, I would... I would uh, come to events like that, and that's where you're going to find, uh, I think, the talent that you want. Cool, and and I'm sure is it up on your website or on Twilio's yes. website or somebody else's? Uh... If you come to our website and or search for BVP Hackathon, um, I'm sure you'll find it. Awesome, great advice. Uh, let's go to uh, let's see, Wes in Dallas. We're getting some advice that we should move our startup to San Francisco. Is that really necessary? What specifically would be different if we moved? So th this comes up with a lot of companies that are um, not located in Silicon Valley, and uh, I think in some cases uh, investors want them to move everybody out here so they can right. be here. So what, what, right. what's, what's your take on that? Um, yeah, it's uh, it's. Um, I'm sure you're you're being advised to move to San Francisco or Silicon Valley, uh, and it's and it's super critical because if you move here, you can. You can pay five times as much for your rent. You can pay double, you know, salaries. Um, find it really hard to keep your engineers because they're so heavily recruited by other people. Um, you will probably, you know, sell whatever house you've got and move into a little tiny studio apartment. Um, a and, cottage? You no, know, not a cottage. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, and so, look, I I I think often that advice is given. Uh, to enhance the convenience of the investor who doesn't want to fly to Dallas and having people move their families and their kids and all this to San Francisco so that an investor doesn't have to get on an airplane seems to me somewhat bizarre. Now, there are cases where it's a good idea. It's, only, it's a good idea if your customer target customer set is in a particular geography. And if what you are developing, say, is a developer toolkit um, or an API that's really targeting uh, you know, next generation developers, then it's probably a pretty good idea to be here in San Francisco. But that doesn't mean the whole company has to move. It means you have to have developer evangelists who are here. Um, if you're selling to the financial industry, then you probably want to be in New York. But again, you don't have to move the whole company there. Um, one of the reasons that Bessemer has a global presence, we have offices in countries, uh, many different countries, is because we really want to go out and find the best opportunities wherever they are. And uh, we don't want to let geography uh, constrain us. There are other you know, very successful firms who just decide they're only going to invest in Silicon Valley or only in certain geographies. And um, I, I personally don't really believe that it's that it's important for the company. I think it's only convenient for the investors for them to move. Got it. All right. Well, uh, Wes, I hope that helps. Uh, I think uh, I think that that does come up a lot. And uh, and I, I think you're right. There, there are there are advantages and disadvantages to being here, right? Um, you know, getting access to all sorts of uh, people in the ecosystem is one of the positives. But the flip side is it costs you a lot to be able to do that, to to live here personally, to recruit people, uh, et cetera. So you know, I, I love when I hear a company's making it in Chicago or DC or Bangalore or you know wherever, right? Uh, that they're they're uh, they're doing great. So. I think, I mean, think about the cost of what it would take to move here 
and then you know take 20% of that budget and give yourself a big fat travel budget to to come and spend you know a week a month in San Francisco and meet everybody you need to meet with and you fly in uber around and go home and you'll achieve the same thing yeah yeah sounds good all right um, let's go to uh, Mikey in New York as late stage private market valuations become more disconnected with public market valuations how do you think about the need for a proper market mechanism to adjust private valuations lower especially given the negative connotations of a down round. That was a mouthful, and I'm not even sure I, I, I fully understood it because I was reading it, but hopefully you get the gist of that one? I do, okay. I do. So the question is that uh, there are companies out there who are raising money with valuations in the billions or even tens of billions of dollars. Yep. And, uh, and, it's, and, and yet if these companies were public, they would be valued less. Uh, there's no doubt, you can look at the you can look at the finances and you can look at the multiples of the comparable companies that are public and and public investors will only pay those multiples i yep. mean if it's a really great company they might pay a little bit more a premium because they love it but you know they're it's only going to be a small premium so so what's going to happen now that these companies have raised these big rounds what does the next round look like and if the next round if if they end up going public then it's actually going to be a down round and, and, as, and as the questioner says, down rounds can be pretty ugly because people are disillusioned, investors are disillusioned, more importantly, the employees are disillusioned. Um, and, so, and so that can be, that can be a, a, actually, an IPO can actually be a negative event instead of a positive event yeah. in those situations. Which is a weird dynamic, right? Yeah. Like not one we're used to dealing with here. That's right, that's right. So, um, so what I would say is that there's two, there are two constituents here. There are the employees and the investors. Fortunately, uh, because people are investing this money in preferred stock, the common stock can still be valued much lower. And so the, the strike price of the options that, that people are getting will be much lower than what people are paying for the preferred. If people are investing in a company at a $3 billion valuation, the employees may really be uh, getting options that, that they would have to exercise at maybe something more like an $800 million valuation. And so if the company goes has a down round for the investors, it may, not be, may still be a positive event for the employees. For the investors, uh, they, they, they could have a, a, a difficult situation. I, don't, I think the company needs to go ahead and, and do what it needs to do anyway. Um, but a lot of those investors will actually be fine. And the reason is that, at least up until recently, these preferred rounds always have lots of well, preferences in them. And so um, if somebody, you know, you read about these valuations, you say, well, that's a crazy price. But it's not so crazy if you think that um, these investors are putting in, say, $100 million at a billion dollar valuation. Right. Um, the company is doing very well. The company is worth at least, say, two or $300 million, even by, you know, by, by any stretch. And so if the company were to sell in a dis in even in, dis in a distressed state, the preferred investors would get their money back, because that's one of the terms: is that is that we get our money out if we don't convert into common. So, they're investing at a billion dollars, with no with almost no downside, and so they feel like, okay, it's a high price. I know no matter what, I'm going to get my money back. And if the company is the next Google or Uber, then I'm actually going to do great. Yeah. And so that's the way they look at it. So even though these even though they're the prices are totally disconnected. It is preferred stock. Now, what's happened more recently is that there's been so much, there's been so much demand for unicorns that a lot of companies have recently said, you know, we're not even going to give you these guarantees. If we go public, we're going to convert you at the IPO price, even if it's less than the price you paid wow. for the round. And in those companies, the preferred investors are going to are going to get hurt. And so, no liquidation preference. Uh... If the company is sold, there's a liquidation preference. Okay. But if the company goes public, no, you just convert. And so you invest at three billion dollars, and the company goes public at a billion and a half, and you've lost half your investment. Wow. And that and so that's that's, that's happening now, huh? That well, no, it's not happening yet because uh, it's only recently that companies have started getting that that term. But those um, from terms investors. are being written. Oh, in those now. are being written in, and so and and these companies are raising so much money. That it's going to be many years before they run out. Got it. Um, but you know they may choose to go public in actually they may choose to go public in two years, and in which case you're going to see 
some investors feeling kind of unhappy about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for the most part, I think people will at least get their money back. Well, and, and one of the things I find most startup founders don't understand is liquidation preferences and how that works in a variety of different situations. And it goes back to the earlier advice, like read up about it, you know, go, uh, uh, Naval and Nivi had some great stuff online with, uh, what was it, Venture Hacks, was mm -hmm. that the name of their, you know, yeah. just talking about all that stuff or on AngelList or you, you really need to understand, you know, in the the low situation, the okay situation, and the high situation, what is going to happen with preferred, common, you know, all, all of the people involved, because uh, I, I think most times entrepreneurs don't know. And, uh, uh, you know, like I, I've heard of stories where a venture firm comes in with a very high offer, but, you know, what the entrepreneur neglects to understand is the 3x liquidation preference that's, you know, baked in along with that very high valuation. So um, not fully understanding all the implications of all the terms, which uh, can usually end up in a bad, uh, bad situation. So, mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, uh, Mikey, great question. Thanks for, um, thanks for sending that in. Let's... Um, Let's move on to uh, William in LA. What is the preferred age or experience level of the founders you like to back? Are you more in the right out of college camp or do you like to back teams with more experience? And please explain why. Um, well, all of the I above? Won't, I, won't, I won't comment on age. I, I will say that, that, that there's a lot of, there's great value in experience and there's also great value in in high energy and an unencumbered uh, an, un, an un, unencumbered commitment to the mission of the startup and you know you tend to get the energy and the commitment from the less experienced entrepreneurs out there uh, I think that that uh, that it depends the answer is that it depends on what kind of company you're building if you're building an enterprise-oriented business, I think we would tend towards the more experienced entrepreneurs because um, there is a science to how you build these companies and you, you can learn it. Um, and if you're building something that's really just totally wacky and new, then, um, then you know, that's something that anyone can do who's, uh, who's brilliant. And, and the most important thing that I look for is, uh, is intellectual honesty. So people who are who who uh, solicit criticism all the time, people mm. who want to hear criticism, people who are constantly trying to figure out what's wrong with what they're doing, so that they can fix it and make it better and better and better. And that's um, you you can find that in you know people who are are young, or you can find it in people who are experienced. And but um, that's to me that's the that's the that's the killer trait I'm looking for. Ah. Interesting. Yeah, I've never never heard that before, but it, it makes a lot of sense because uh, mm -hmm. your startup is constantly evolving, and yeah. so if you're not always questioning assumptions and and you know looking at your business and trying to figure it out, uh, you know you're probably dying. <laughs> and so uh, so to be able to do that and not get defensive or feel like somebody's you know raining on your parade, that's that's a that's a great skill to have. Yeah, I mean people who there it's a it's obviously a mistake to think that you can't make mistakes and that if you made a mistake, it somehow reflects badly on you and you have to hide it. And so, you know, one of the first things I do when I meet people is I ask them, tell me about their experiences and where they've worked. And no matter where they've worked, something bad happened at that company, right? <laughs> and then I ask them about that bad thing that happened at the company. Yep. And, um, so, and so some people say, oh yeah, that was, that was, uh, that was terrible. Those they, like they just they just screwed it up, and I told them not to do it, and they did it anyway. And what a mess that was, yeah. right? And other people say, "Yeah, that was terrible. We really screwed that up. We didn't see this coming and this coming. And you know, if we could have done it again, this is how we would have done it differently. Next time we'll do it differently." And the the way they speak about it tells me a lot about about whether they whether they they get defensive or whether they they try to learn from their mistakes. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That's great. All right, well, let's, um, I think we've got time for one or two more here. Um, let's go to Jack in Santa Cruz. Uh, 
Does it surprise you that a company like Zertual could run out of money? How does something like that happen? And I, I honest, I don't know. You guys, investors in Zertual, or uh, no, we're not. Okay, so um, I, if you were, I was going to say you can take a pass on this one, but you're not, so you got to answer it. So uh, uh, except I, I don't know the situation. Oh, I can't well, answer that this, one. This is the company that uh, ran out of money, um, and they they kind of discovered it too late, and then it got blamed on the the uh, temporary CFO and the, the woman who was the CEO. Uh, uh, they were hiring too many people or something. This is classic, you know, they just ran right off a cliff and out of huh. money. So, you know, my, my answer would be, uh, you know, you got, you got to know your financial situation, know your burn rate and how much runway you have left and uh, don't do that. But uh, what do you think? I think don't do that is probably the best, the best advice. Okay. I mean, obviously, companies run out of money sometimes and they should because their business isn't working. But if the business is working and they're just not paying attention, you know they're driving along the highway and don't notice the empty on um, you know empty light on the on the gas tank. That's that's that's, uh, that's, that's a dumb mistake to make. Yep, I, I had that happen once. Uh, I will not name the company. Uh, I was on the board of it actually, and uh, you know the CEO says I made a terrible mistake. <laughs> the financials were wrong, and instead of having three months of cash left, we mm. have you know two weeks of cash left or something yeah. crazy, right? And uh, we had to, we found a, a buyer in five days. I mean, it was crazy. So, uh, you know, that that really, that that was uh, not not quite criminal, but uh, pretty disappointing. Like that, somebody had made such a huge error like that. But you know, companies make mistakes all the time. Yeah. They're doing, they're trying to do a lot with very few people. And so, um, you know, in that situation, if the company is not doing well, okay, then find a buyer, do whatever you have to do, shut it down. Um, if I were in that situation in a business that's otherwise a healthy business and I have, a, I have an, a, an entrepreneur who is a critical thinker and does learn from his or her mistakes, if the person comes in and says, I made this terrible mistake and, and followed it with, here's what we did wrong and I need some money from my investors and then here's how I'm gonna make sure this never happens again, I'll say, great, here's some money now we here's some additional runway let's go give us some breathing room to figure yeah. out what our financing strategy is and and fix it the way you're supposed to fix it nothing ever goes according to plan <laughs> and um and you know i i would never pull out of a company because they they make mistakes i only pull out of companies if they make mistakes and don't admit it and don't try to fix them yeah makes sense all right, well, we've got about 30 seconds left, so we'll do one quick one from Paul in Boston. What's the craziest company that you've ever invested in, and how did it work out? So putting you on the spot a little bit. Uh, uh, so uh, the craziest company, um, well, I think you know Skybox Imaging, uh, as we talked about, sure. was a company that wanted to put satellites up in space, college kids, basically, well, a little more than college kids, grad students, but basically saying we're gonna deploy a constellation that's gonna disrupt a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, I didn't really know much about space. I knew, well, no, I knew nothing about space. And I said, okay. Um, and it worked that's out, uh, it ended up working out terrific. And they, they, I think they've changed the industry. Yeah, and they were, they were bought by somebody, right? They were uh, bought by Google. And by actually, Google. they're right down the street from the studio and they're thriving, they're doing great. Awesome. Well, um, thanks for taking the time today. I'm sorry we're, we're out of, out of time to answer more questions, but uh, but great job today. Okay, terrific, that was fun. Thank All right, you. my pleasure. Um, uh, if you wanna follow David uh, on Twitter, his handle is at David Cowan, D-A-V-I-D-C-O-W-A-N. Maybe it's on the screen right now, who knows? Um, tune in next week for another episode of Founder Line. Our guest will be Heaton Shaw, and Heaton's a serial entrepreneur, advisor, investor in a bunch of companies. Um, he started uh, Crazy Egg and Kiss Metrics and Quick Sprout. Um, he's also just one of the nicest guys around who gives countless hours to the entrepreneurial community, helping founders out, giving advice. Uh, uh, you know, he, he's done it for me and and for many others over the years. So um, uh, it should be should be a fun show. And uh, make sure you send him really tough questions. I'm sure he would enjoy those. Uh, that'll be next Wednesday, September 23rd at 5 o'clock Pacific time. Uh, thank you once again to our fantastic sponsors, Auric, Square One Bank, Accretive Solutions, and Ustream. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Uh, our handle is at Founderline. Uh, you can send us questions in advance there or email them to help at founderline.com. 
Uh, you can also go to our website to uh, check out upcoming guests, uh, find out more about past shows. You can go watch the videos, um, and you can also subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Uh, thanks for watching. Here's to the crazy ones, and we'll see you again next time.